Now you said that you believe that God has forgiven you. Yes. Do you still keep in touch uh, with your dad? Yes. Uh, without getting too personal, uh, how's he doing? He's doing fine. But he asked me not to talk about him. I understand. That's what I said. Safeguard his privacy and privacy of his family. Okay. In terms of the correspondence you carry on with the different people and different ministry people and so on and so forth, what's your mail flow like around here? And I don't mean recently. It's been a lot. Been a lot. Uh, I don't make a big deal of it. I just consider it as part of my life now, part of, in a sense, part of my ministry. Uh, I get letters from people from all walks of life. Most people are sincere. Some are having you know, very serious problems. And for whatever reasons, God, I believe, leads them to me. And I'm able to minister to them and uh, encourage them, share Christian gospel with them, uh, even some teenagers. And so it's uh, been good. Sort of ironic, isn't it? I mean, you're dealing, doing all this stuff through the mail these days. You keep the post office busy. What's that, a little nod of loyalty to your old employer? You know, once a postman, always a postman. Yeah. Is this, is this, is this, does this, all this work that you're doing now, do you feel that this is helping you make up for some of the bad stuff that you were involved in? Do you feel like you're paying back a little bit? Yeah. I, uh, these things, I, I, first of all, I want to be a good Christian because uh, I want to please the Lord, but it's my way of saying that I'm sorry for the things that happened in the past, and uh, I'm sorry for, uh, you know, being that, that bad person and being a fool, and uh, this is my way of, if I could reach out to some young person and through the videos and so forth that are going all over the place in schools and churches, uh, youth facilities, prisons. I know that if I, if I reach some of them with that warning that you don't want to come to prison, that you don't want to throw your life away, that, that, that you could have a better life through Jesus Christ, if, if somehow I could touch, touch some of them and get them to change their direction, then it would have served a purpose. I, I really believe with all my heart that uh, the message that I'm sharing today through the written pamphlets or through the videos have actually saved a lot of lives and, and there's ministers to verify that where their kids or whatever or who've heard that message and have instead of going in the path that they were going which may have led eventually to a graveyard an early grave they've given their life to Christ instead and they're better people today because of it and so I'm thankful for that that's truly a blessing and that's not me doing that I believe it's God God works through people ordinary people let me ask you something. Be, prison, of course, is for punishment, but it's for something else, too. Rehabilitation. Is that correct? The purpose of prison. I mean, people get sent to prison for punishment, but isn't it a fact that prison systems also like to rehabilitate people if they can? I guess you could say that, yeah. Certainly, uh, uh, you want, they want someone to learn their lesson where they don't come back to a place like this and don't throw their life away and hurt some other lives and damage other people, you know. And you would hope that someone would come to prison and, you know, if they do get out, they would learn their lesson. And, but I feel that for what I see more than that is pl prison is a, is a place of reflection and self-examination where a man is forced to come to terms with himself. You know, you take a guy that's 30 years old, 40 years old, maybe he's got a couple of kids out there maybe a wife, maybe he's with her, maybe he's not, but here's a guy that's an adult and he's in prison doing time, five years, 10 years, 15 years or more. There come, there, there has to, you know, it's like a point of reality where you gotta face yourself and say, wait, what, what am I doing with my life? What am, I, what am I doing? Where am I going? What's my goal? What's my direction? And I think that being in prison now 22 years, I've seen a lot of men uh, come to terms with that where they realize that they, at, at some certain point, they realized that they were doing like traveling a dead end, traveling a road to destruction. And that's where like in here, the chapel has been such a blessing where we have a chaplain that, you know, ministers to the men. And we have a, a place where guys go for nurturing and encouragement. 
Do you, um, speaking of punishment, I mean, the, the death penalty wasn't in effect in New York when all of the 44 incidents went down. You know, if you, if you even for your role in it, um, had, had, how would you have felt if the death penalty was still around then, or was around then? Did you care at that point? There was a time when uh, I had given up hope. I, was, I feel so far under satanic power and satanic control that I didn't care. I was more like a robot than a person. There was a time in my life when I feel that I was just utterly under a, a, a powerful influence that was destructive and, and I didn't care if I, it was a point where I didn't care if I lived or died. How did these people get such control over you? It, it was a process. It took uh, time. It was like little by little. I, I mean, I'm telling you, I didn't know it was going to come this way. I mean, when I got out of the service, I wanted to make a life for myself. My dad was moving to Florida. Most of my friends had, had guess, all gone or all changed directions in their life. and I. I just wanted to make a life for myself. I got an apartment. I had saved up and when I was in the service enough money to buy a used car to rent an apartment. I got a job as a security guard. I, I enrolled in Bronx Community College. I, I wanted to have a future, you know, and I, I don't know. Everything got turned upside down. I, I, it just, uh, I had good goals and uh, I just fell into some, under some kind of powerful influence. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You were a middle class guy, yeah. middle class. Family's middle class, you were middle class. Now, based on what I understand, there were some people involved in this circle, if you will. There were some money people. Yeah. There were some influential people, high rollers. So you saw some of the high life, so to speak, right? I mean, do you think that had some of it too? You say, wow, these rich people are out doing this so it can't be all that bad? Nah. I don't know. I just kind of fell into the flow of things, and uh, I never really looked at it or analyzed that of their lifestyle. Uh, yeah, but you would accepted it. I, I, mean, it I didn't. I didn't really want that. See, to me, I was always content. To I, money or that kind of thing never really impressed me. I was just a. I was just content to maybe have a job, raise a family, live in the suburbs one day. That was one of my goals in life. It wasn't to be a millionaire or big ride around on a big car and those material things just never really impressed me there were people that had that and you know I just didn't think one way or the other okay that's what i was getting at because if i recall correctly you were at parties in the hamptons and in greenwich yeah. connecticut mm -hmm. and some big places in manhattan and westchester county and you saw some of these people with yeah. some bucks i mean i was trying to find out if that was part of the thing that helped entice you into this saying wow these people are into this and look at all they got no i was just mainly a tag along guy and just didn't really get impressed with that. No. This is this is a very valid issue. This we've talked about in the past, and this is that there was a great deal made of the fact that in uh, 19, around Mother's Day of 1975, mm -hmm. you finally found your natural mother. Yes. And there was one psychiatrist in particular who would later say that this is what put Berkowitz over the edge. He was so filled with rage because he had met his natural mother and she was a disappointment, et cetera, et cetera. Can you re would you respond to that? Yeah, I did um, find my natural mother. It was something that I just had in my heart to do. I had come across some literature from the Adoptees Liberty Movement, and uh, this was back in early 75 or, or somewhere around 74, and I just uh, suddenly had this urge to go f see if I can possibly find my uh, natural parents because I was always curious it was always like a driving thing and to make a long story short I did meet as you said it was in 75 I even lost track of the time I did meet my natural mother and she turned out to be a very nice person and we got along really good typical Jewish mother and I found out I had a half sister and we really kind of hit it off pretty good uh, I started to go over to their house all the time I was out in uh, where my sister lived in Queens uh, She's long since moved away. Uh, my mom had lived out in uh, Brooklyn just briefly and then moved to Long Island to Atlantic, uh, what's the Long Beach. And I was over at her house a number of times. We had a fine relationship and she used to cook meals and it was totally false that I had any rage or animosity towards her. Uh, 
that was, I feel that at that time with that uh, psychologist, he was mainly, and this is not a criticism, but look, you know, just looking back, it's, he was mainly interested in um, fitting me into these different molds that he already had. You know, as a Freudian psychologist, he had these certain molds you have to go into. It always reverts back to the childhood, the mother, a bad relationship. But uh, that was completely false. Which brings something to mind. Somebody, not you, told me a long time ago that you had actually read a book called The Murdering Mind to be familiar with some of the psychology of this kind of stuff so that you could give the right answers to shrinks? Yeah, that's true, yeah. It's true. Yeah. So are you saying you were just parroting back to them what you thought they wanted to hear? Yeah, yeah. But there was a whole reason for that, too. It's, it's, it's such a long story. It was that McGraw-Hill thing with Mr. Klausner and all the stuff that resulted from that. I had felt really betrayed by uh, the attorneys, and it's no big deal. At that time, I was in a really depressed and frame of mind, just coming into prison and, you know, just facing everything. It was just so overwhelming. And then when I found out that the attorneys that represented me had been working out a deal to write a book with this guy, and eventually a book was published uh, by McGraw-Hill, which did, I think, it didn't do well. It kind of bombed. But anyway, at that time when I found out that was coming out, I, I contacted the Mr. Abrahamson, Dr. Abrahamson, and, and kind of pretty much told him what he wanted to hear, you know. And, uh, and that was foolish. I mean, at the time, I was just handling everything the wrong way. And uh, at that time, I was, uh, you know, depressed and suicidal in prison. And, uh, you know, I just... At that time, were you still uh, involved in the occult? I used to practice at... In the very beginning, like rituals in my cell and everything, it was stupid. It was stupid. Yeah, we're talking about that, not now. Yeah, I know, but it was just, uh, yeah, it was, yeah. So when you first came to prison and for the, a period of time, you were actually doing your own private rituals in your cell? Briefly, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I just, uh, I was locked into a certain way of thinking. It's, it's just impossible to explain, and I really hesitate to talk about it because sometimes it's just so taken out of context and misunderstood but I was just into a type of thinking which I believe that later on in life Christ had completely set me free from and if it wasn't for uh, my faith in Christ if it wasn't for that other inmate reaching out to me one day and beginning to share his faith with me and bring me along that path I probably would be just uh, a miserable lonely individual now just caught up in my own world or in the ground or in the you know I believe God spared my life. I don't know why. I, there's so many times and I'm talking to the Lord when I say my prayers. I say, why, God? Why Why did you spare my life? And uh, he just keeps reassuring me that he loves me and that uh, things are going to be okay. Now, isn't it so that a substantial number of people whom you were associated with on the streets back in 76 and 77 are in the ground? That's what I've heard. I you know, I don't know how accurate all that is. I, I don't know that the Carr brothers and so forth and lost their lives shortly after I was arrested. And what exactly exactly transpired, I don't know. Well, it's I mean, been a lot. Young girls like Dawn Coons yeah. and uh, and Frank. Well, Frank Signorelli died in jail, and uh, uh, Joe Carosa, who had the yacht in New Rochelle, yeah, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's a laundry list of uh, of, of people yeah. who died violently, either yeah. murder, accidents, yeah. overdoses, suicides. Yeah. That's uh, what happens when, this is why I try so fervently to, to reach people with the gospel, because I know what Satan can do to a person. Uh, Satan can utterly destroy a, li a human life, and uh, just as the Bible says that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but that Christ comes to give an abundant life. And if people dabble in things, if they follow that, that path that I was on, eventually, uh, they can end up destroying themselves because there are powers behind the scenes. I know the pe many people say, oh, bah humbug, I don't believe that stuff. Well, it's true whether the people believe it or not, it's reality. There are powers, entities that people get involved with that could twist a person's mind, uh, ultimately destroy that person's life. Do you remember Jimmy Kahn, not the actor? Yes. The one who lived in your building? Yeah. After you got arrested, you know, 
Khan was went up to his job trying to get a gun mm -hmm. because he said people were now after him. Mm -hmm. Now, Khan uh, was involved in this case, at least in terms of Untermeyer Park, yep. not at crime scenes. And he drove that yellow VW once in a while. Well, Khan is the latest one. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Khan committed suicide uh, around last Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So, for the record, it's up to that we know of about 21 people uh, who were associates of yours in one way or another uh, on the wrong side of this case have, have died since your arrest. And only one of them, uh, whose name we know, Mr. D, uh, died of natural causes and he was elderly. All the others were young and uh, unnatural causes. Does that say anything to you about, uh, about all this? Uh, yeah. That the devil means business. That doesn't play. I, that's what I've been sharing in my testimony uh, time and time again. That the devil does not play. And a uh, person follows him or serves him. Uh, they're throwing their life away. They don't know what they're getting into. What, what could start out as dabbling could ultimately lead, lead to total possession. I, I've seen it in the past. I know what happened to me. And I hesitate to share these things in, in, in the public because it, it just sounds so unbelievable. People really can't accept that. They don't really understand or my words get twisted. It's been a real uphill battle to even share. Uh, but uh, mainly today, I just see that my calling in life, what I feel is my calling, is to share the good news of Jesus Christ and, and to reach as many with that message of hope as possible. I mean, even in other countries today, you know, the videos are going into the Philippines, into Russia, uh, translated in different languages, uh, Romania, in Romania. And I, I mean, I have to look at that and say, well, I can't do anything about the past. I made wrong choices. I did foolish things. I threw my life away. I hurt other people and destroyed their lives. And I'm sorry for that. Uh, I can't change the past anymore. If I only knew what, what I was getting into at the beginning, as I said, I would have just ran away. But uh, Rejoin the army. Yeah, that would have, uh, even to that. As I said, when I left the service, I was all ready to begin a new life. I had bought a stereo, a expensive stereo system, a Sansui stereo system overseas where the rates were cheap. I had it shipped to the United States. I got my own apartment, my own car. I saved up money when I was in the service. I, I enrolled in the Bronx Community College. I got a part time job. I was going to school in the GI Bill. I, I thought I had a future, you know, and then. Everything just flipped around. I, I didn't think I'd ever end up in a place like this. Oh, it's the Catskills. What are the Jewish comedians going to think of? <laughs> Why, th <laughs> I've heard, I've just Why do you think, go ahead. Um, in terms of, you know, you said you, you had a dream, you know, to have the typical, you know, somebody growing up in the 50s, the wife, the kids, the suburbs. I was wondering if more could ask you, have you had any kind of a romantic relationship with anyone, maybe somebody whose heart was drawn to you and they began writing to you. I know that happens. That's an interesting human interest kind of question. Mm -hmm. uh, some of, uh, uh, let's say, female friends over the years, without names, just in general, who you've corresponded with. You know, just, you know, you've developed some female friends. Is that correct? Uh, well, I wouldn't say like that, like really romantic. I do have, but this is off the record, I think. I do have, because I want to protect privacy. I learned to, this is, this is my life. This is going to be the rest of my life. And I, but it, it, it's hard to describe it. It doesn't bother me anymore because I, I've, God has given me peace about it. And uh, I can accept, you know, this is, is kind of where I am, where I'll be. Uh, People get married even with yeah. life, even with yeah. consecutive life. Yeah, <laughs> they do. Menendez got married. Oh, right. The uh, <laughs> so no marriage plans at all. No, no marriage plans. No. At least not at the moment. No. You know, uh, if I can, let me see if I can get this this idea right that Lisa talked about before. It's it's the idea that there are as many. The authorities say that there are as many as perhaps 50 serial killers going around America at one time. And um, I mean, from somebody, from the point of view of somebody who had been involved in something like that, granted not by yourself, 
I mean, is there something that the authority should do or people should be on the lookout for as a way to help identify this kind of thing, this kind of thing? You know, I'm not really an expert on that. I, I, people, those people come from all walks of life. There's a lot of, see, the way I look at it, I look at it from the eyes of a person like who's like a minister today. And I, I see that there's just a lot of hurting people out there, a lot of confused, lonely, troubled people, and uh, a lot of angry people, a lot of tormented people. And uh, that's why, you know, as a Christian, I, I try to reach as many as I can because I believe with all my heart that it's, it's a personal relationship with God that can give a person hope, that can give a person meaning in life. That, I don't know what causes that kind of behavior. I really don't know it, understand it at all. So you're not auditioning for the job as host of America's Most Wanted? No. <laughs> no, but I mean, I mean, it's more the, the, the concept that it, in terms of how should a person know if there's someone who needs help so badly, who's so troubled, yeah. that they're going to cross that line and commit murder? Yeah. What advice would you give to someone to look out for so that maybe they could get someone to help them? Family members, friends. Uh, wow, that's... Because uh, that's something you would know from ministering to people because you've seen the people who need the help so badly. What yeah. are those symptoms? You could tell for it. Uh, wow. Take your time. I mean, you were one of them. You could reach into your own past or yeah. any other person that you've met in this environment when I'm yeah. sure there were plenty. Yeah. I think I think that uh, what people need is is closeness. In, in society today, people are so far apart, and even in, in families, uh, so many families are broken, broken homes. And I don't mean just the broken homes in the sense that maybe dad's in prison or mom and dad are separated or something like that. But sometimes the family could be in like all under the same roof, mom and dad and the kids, and yet the home can still be broken because people are not communicating, there, there's no real bonding, there's, there's no deeper love. And sometimes even in one's own home, there could be strangers. Uh, I think it's so important for people to communicate and to spend time with one another in a family unit as much as possible. I know that, for example, in the incident in Columbine, uh, those kids had parents, and they were from homes that on all purposes seemed to be stable and, and so forth. And yet, some ways you look at that, and yet there was, within the home, there was a broken relationship. And it seemed like those parents really didn't have an understanding of how far into, let's say, just use the word evil, those kids had fallen. and. The parents seem to be, from what I understand, just kind of oblivious to that. My heart goes out to them because I'm sure they must be struggling with that very much, asking themselves a lot of questions, why, why. But I, I can see that there's a need for people to be closer and uh, to know one another better. And, and so, so what signs then would those parents have had to see, have seen? That's, you know, what is it that you would see in someone that would say to you, aha, the light bulb goes off on top of your head. That person's about to blow up the high school. <laughs> that person's yeah. about to you know, shoot people. What is it that you would recognize in another human being that would tip you off so that you could say, Jesus, I've got to help this person. You know, yeah. That's the yeah. kind of thing okay. I'm just curious about. Okay, okay. Well, I think that uh, sometimes with, like, let's say teenagers or young adults, there's an obsession with death. There's a, uh, a sense of loneliness, a sense of hopelessness, a sense of despair. I think that a person that's going through some kind of self-destructive or destructive thoughts kinds of, kind of isolates themselves from others. And, and if a person's in a home with somebody, they see them becoming detached, remote, aloof. And there's maybe a time to just kind of reach out there. It's like, hey, what's going on with your life? I see you're struggling with something. Uh, what's on your mind? Let's, let's share, let's, let's open up a little bit. A lot of times, uh, people just need someone to really talk to, someone to spend time with them, a friend that, or a friend or a family member that's gonna stick close with them. And uh, when these things are not there, people get into, it's so easy to get into their own frame of mind and their world becomes real small 
and they don't see the whole picture. They begin to just dwell on their own problems, their own anger, their own frustrations in life, and those things begin to percolate inside of a person, build up, and, and next thing you know, you have some kind of rage, anger, something like that. Uh, I see that people need to know that there's a God, that there's a God that cares about them, that it, there's a God that has a, a place in life for them. I think in here, I know a lot of guys feel very maybe insignificant in the world or so forth, but um, I don't see that way myself that way anymore. I see myself as a person who has a, a purpose in life. I get up in the morning with a sense of purpose as a Christian. Well, I'm going to do the best I can to share with somebody today, to reach out to somebody today, to encourage them. Uh, you know, without those things, I, I just don't see how people can make it in this world. People try to lose themselves in all kinds of, of things. And I, I, when a person begins to become uh, aloof, that's usually a sign that they're going through something. Well, don't you think people withdraw to, I mean, there's different forms of withdrawal. I mean, you can withdraw into TV, into the internet, into drugs, into yeah. alcohol. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, not in here. Nobody hears on drugs, alcohol, or on the internet, and they're certainly not watching too much TV. I don't think. It's just another one of the things of the case. You know how myths pr travel on and on about this brown-haired girls and and all that. Was there anything to that? No. Okay. And I just, you know. I in terms of just reaching back to your lowest point, because you've come so far from so low. If you could Thank you. try to talk a little bit of just comparing mm -hmm. how you felt, if you could just reach into your heart and try to talk a little bit about feeling like you were in the depths of that moment where suicide was clearly something that would have been an option right now. It's the last thing that you would consider yeah. because you have a purpose, and I'd love you to... That, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's a very reasonable question, too, Dave. That's one we tried earlier and you didn't want to talk about. I just asked you if you could c contrast or compare the David Berkowitz of 1977 to the David Berkowitz of today. Huh. The difference. Uh, the David Berkowitz of the past was a very uh, guy living without a lot of, without any hope, and uh, was a very uh, troubled and tormented person. Uh, it was a, I believe that I was a demon possessed, and the reason is because I allowed Satan to enter into me, and through rituals and incantations and other stupid things. I look back at that and say, man, that was garbage. I was an idiot to even do those things, but I didn't think it was going to end in destruction of others and even throwing my own life away. But today, thanks to Christ, I mean, I, today I'm living with hope. I know that God has forgiven me even though others may never forgive me. And I have peace with God. I have peace, peace with myself. I have uh, joy. I have a future. And uh, I believe that Christ is coming soon, and one day I'm going to be with him. One day, you know, that's the, one of the tenets of the Christian faith is that Christ will come again. And when that happens, in an instant of an eye, I'll be up in heaven with him. And that's a hope that uh, millions of Christians have. I live with that hope, and I face the future looking forward to being a good, being the best I can be as a person. And trying to touch as many lives as possible, trying to reach out to as many as possible in the time I have left, however long that may be. Now you said that you believe that God has forgiven you. Yes. But have you been able to forgive yourself or is that something you'll never be able to do? There was a long time of struggle where I couldn't forgive myself. And I went through a lot of pain uh, in, during that time period. But one day a minister was preaching a sermon uh, from the book of Micah, the prophet, and he talked about God taking all your sins and throwing them into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered anymore. And as he was speaking, I felt like God's spirit, I know it's a hard thing to understand, but I, I kind of sense God's spirit just kind of bloom in me in that moment where I felt God was reaching out to me and saying, David, your sins are forgiven. David, I've 
completely forgiven you. I love you. I want you to know that. And right then and there, it's like a light went off inside me. And I knew from that moment that my sins were completely forgiven. They were forgiven the moment I came to Christ, but it took me a number of years before I was finally able to realize the need to just forgive myself and to let go. And that's what I try to do today is just let go of the past as much as possible. I hate talking about it. I hate dwelling on it. It's like another life that I don't even recognize anymore. Now you were talking about forgiveness in a spiritual sense. Yes. But I don't think that you're implying, or are you, that the rest of society should just say, okay, no harm, no foul. No, not, not at all. I mean, I, uh, I committed serious crimes. I, I deserve to be in prison for the rest of my life. I, I recognize that. I know that people will never forgive me. That's okay. That's, that's normal, you know. That's, but still, my life goes on. 